Hello, my name is Tom Fritchman and I'm an Applications Engineer here at Strain Optics and today we will be talking about our three-point contact roller wave gauge. Customers often ask us what the difference is between the three-point contact gauge and our flat bottom gauge. One of the main differences is that there is no wear surface on our three-point contact gauge. We just have these three contacts as opposed to the flat bottom gauge which has this long surface that can pick up debris and eventually get scratched, which requires it to come back to us for resurfacing. Another benefit of the three-point contact gauge is that we have these adjustable contact feet that we can move to the average wavelength of the roller wave. This allows us more accurate peak-to-valley measurements where the flat bottom gauge typically just rides on top of the peaks and measures into the valleys our three-point contact gauge measures both the peaks and the valleys to great accuracy. This is another reason why the three-point contact gauge should not be compared to measurements from the flat bottom roller wave gauge. Another benefit is that debris that could potentially get caught in the flat bottom gauge and, and scratch the glass that you're working with will not get caught on our three-point contact gauge. It's also uh, able to have an input tool attached to it which will allow us to automatically put measurements directly into a uh, Excel document or Word text document. And lastly, the three-point contact gauge can be used to measure local distortion by pushing our contact feet in as close to the center of the gauge as possible. Next, we will be talking about the operation of the roller wave gauge. The roller wave gauge can be used to determine the peak to valley depth and minimum, average, or maximum. We can use it to determine the optical distortion in millidiopters, and we can enter the information into a chart or the supplied Excel program uh, in accordance with ASTM standard test method C1651. Our first step is to place the glass that we intend to measure on a flat surface that we know is completely flat, like a granite tabletop, or uh, sometimes we could use a at least 10 millimeter thickness annealed piece of glass. The second step is to zero the dial gauge itself on a similar known flat surface. Our third step is that we want to start by putting the gauge itself on the approximate center line of the glass with the plunger tip at least 305 millimeters in from the edge of the glass. This will make sure that there is no edge lift being incorporated into the calculation. Uh, the next step would be to push or pull the gauge along the center line, taking note of each maxima and minima. The maxima will be considered the peaks and the minima will be considered the valleys. And as we heat, hit each peak or valley, we'll make sure to mark it on our measuring tape or mask. When we're ready to start taking measurements, we'll lay a ruler, measuring tape, or strip of masking tape along the glass edge parallel to the direction that the wave gauge will be moving, which is perpendicular to the direction of the roller waves, and this will be used for recording the distances between peaks and valleys. Next, we'll push or pull the gauge along the center line parallel to the ruler, measuring tape, or masking tape, and note the location of each peak, which will be a maxima on the gauge, and each valley, which will be a minima on the gauge, with a washable marker on the glass or on the masking tape. But we will not be recording any depth measurements at this time. So I will start by moving along the center line, again not pushing down on the gauge until I find the first maxima, which will be about here. And I'll note this as location P1. And then I will move to the next minima, which will be our first valley. And I will mark this location as V1. And then I will move on to our next peak will be the next maxima. And this location will be P2. Then on to the next minima, 
which will be V2. Now that we've marked all of the locations of our peaks and valleys, we want to record the distance from the edge to each of those peaks and valleys. So we'll record the distance from the edge to P1, the distance from the edge to V1, the distance from the edge to P2, and the distance from the edge to V2, and so on. After we do that, we can calculate the average wavelength by subtracting the distance from P2, from P1, from V2, from V1, and so on. Divide that by the total number of waves and divide that number by two. That number will tell us the distance from the center of the dial gauge to each contact point on either side, which will be the average wavelength of the roller wave. Once we've done that, we can start collecting the depth data at each of those peaks and valleys that we determined earlier. Before finishing the depth gauge measurements, we want to calculate the average wavelength so that we can set the contact feet to that specific wavelength. To do this, we want to first make sure that we're measuring the correct distance from each peak and each valley. First, we will subtract peak 1 distance from peak 2, which is 212 millimeters in this case. Then we'll subtract V1 from V2, which is 197 millimeters. P2 from P3, which is 219 millimeters. And V2 from V3, which is 228 millimeters. That gives us a total sum of wavelengths of 856 millimeters. And we've done that across four waves. So the average wavelength is 856 divided by 4, which is equal to 214 millimeters. At this point, we'll divide that 214 by 2, which is 107 millimeters, to give us the distance that each contact point should be from the center of the dial gauge. Once we've positioned the contact points to the correct distance from the center of the plunger tip, we will move the gauge along the glass again, but this time record the readings from the digital indicator at each peak and valley. We'll put this data to report the minimum, average, and maximum peak to valley values, or calculate true optical distortion in millidiopters with the following equation. The equation for distortion is D equals 4 pi squared W divided by L squared times 10 to the 6th power, where D is optical distortion in millidiopters, W is our peak to valley or valley to peak depth in millimeters, and L is our wavelength in millimeters. In this particular case, we will determine the distortion from V1, which is our first valley, to P2. In this case, our W value will be 0 0.038, which was the depth at P2, minus a negative 0 0.038, which was our depth at V1, to end up with a W of 0 0.076 millimeters. And from the earlier calculation of our wavelength, from P2 to P1, we found that that was 212 millimeters. When we enter that into our equation for distortion, we end up with 66.76 millidiopters. Finally, we've created a table to calculate this distortion at each peak and valley across our measurements from earlier. As you can see, we've included the distance from the edge, the depth, and then we finally calculated this distortion using the equation from earlier. You'll notice that the first peak and last valley on this table do not have a distortion calculation. This is because the first peak does not have a previous valley that we can use to calculate the distortion, and the last valley does not have a subsequent peak with which we can calculate the distortion. Once we have our final distortion calculations, we can then determine max distortion from the table and average distortion by adding all of our distortions together and dividing by the number of distortions total. With every roller wave gauge instrument, we supply our customers with one of these Excel-based programs. Once we've calculated all of the depths and distances for each peak and valley, we can enter that information into a chart like this.
The first information that we would need is the distance from the edge in millimeters for each peak and each valley. Then we would enter our total number of peaks and total number of valleys, followed by our depth at each peak and each valley. From that information, the Excel-based program automatically calculates the average wavelength in millimeters, our wavelength in millimeters for each peak to the subsequent peak and each valley to its subsequent valley, the local peak to valley and valley to peak depth, which is our W value, our calculated local distortion for a half wave, and then the final information is the calculated local distortion for a full wave. From that full wave calculated distortion, we can find the average distortion, max distortion, maximum peak to valley or valley to peak depth, minimum peak to valley or valley to peak depth, and average peak to valley or valley to peak depth, along with a graph that shows the roller wave. Along with this Excel-based program, there are also two tabs. The first is a report tab, which allows the user to report the requirements of ASTM C1651 and a procedure tab which can be used so that the user can follow the procedure properly if anything's forgotten. And that is the correct way to operate the RWGD instrument and calculate distortion. For more information, please contact us at www.strainoptics.com. And thank you for watching.